Security, and uh, this is joint work with uh, Arnab Roy. Okay, so right away uh, I will get into what uh, UC Security is all about. Uh, this is a notion due to Ron Kennedy. Um, so basically, it's like a generalization of zero knowledge. Right? So it is a very nice paradigm and more useful because you can reason about portions of your security protocol and then argue about embedding them in bigger systems. All right. So it's compositional security, and that's always a good thing to have. So what does UC stand for? Universally composable. All right. so, so the main idea here is that there is a there is a environment which is driving the whole experiment, let's say. Okay. And so that's actually a distinguishing uh, feature from standalone definitions of security. Okay. Uh, so as you will see, that's what enables composability. And so wh what's the main idea? The main idea is you, you're given a real world protocol and then you want to say some, something secure about it. Right? And the way you do it is the specification is given in terms of ideal functionalities. So you assume that, and mostly these are like multi parties computations. Right? Uh, it doesn't have to be, it could be a single party too, but you know, it it's, makes more sense in multi party settings. So, Maybe you could like, give a Yeah, definitely, yeah. So I'll be getting into those. Uh, so, so in fact, this doesn't have to say anything about cryptography. It could be general semantics for all you care, all right, for arbitrary programs, okay. But it makes more sense in the crypto world, okay. But it could be used as a definition for arbitrary, you know, semantics or arbitrary program. It doesn't have to be anything about security. Uh, so, because what you're really saying is the semantics is given in terms of simulatability. And that notion of semantics of bi-simulation has been around forever. All right? So, it's nothing new about cryptography. But, uh, but this notion of the environment and, uh, and of course, when we're talking about cryptographic protocols, we talk about distributions. Uh, so, all those things put together uh, makes it more applicable or a more powerful tool in terms of dealing with cryptographic protocols. So, so for example, one you know simple thing could be a key exchange between two parties. All right. So, so then how do you actually give a specification for key exchange? And that's what this is all. This thing is about the ideal functionality, where you assume that there is a there is a trusted third party in a way. Okay, which will do all the computations for all the parties, okay, and then just hand back the results to individual parties. So, so here it is in a so so there there is this notion of first specifying what is key exchange, and that's very nicely done using ideal functionalities. So what you have is if there were two parties who wanted to do key exchange, in this ideal world you just assume that they are just dummy parties they themselves do nothing, all right? They just feed their input to this ideal trusted third party, both of them, and the trusted third party will compute a key for them and then just give it back to them. And this slightly heavier arrows mean they, these are like uh, secure channels, all right? So, so here these are not heavy links, so they are assumed to be insecure. All right. So in the ideal world, you assume that there is a secure channel from each dummy party to the ideal functionality. And here, I'll get to that. So, 
So now what happens is, so how do you define? So that was just a way of saying, okay, this is what you would ideally like to have, all right? Of course, there is still an adversarial situation, okay, in the real world, because these links are not secure, all right? So the adversary, for instance, can listen to these links and in fact feed his own uh, network information into those links, all right? So, so what you would really like to say is that suppose there is a real protocol which you claim to be actually computing or doing this multi-party computation of key exchange, all right? Then you would like to say that this situation is simulatable here by another adversary which we call the simulator, okay? So there is a real world adversary and then there is this simulator adversary in the ideal world. So what essentially you, you would like to say that these two worlds are indistinguishable. So if the adversary actually got some information here, he would also have got it here. But here we have specified it so stringently that you, you can see that this simulator basically, you can specify that this simulator basically gets nothing useful, all right? So if you had specified it like that, and then you proved that these two are indistinguishable situations, then you've basically shown that in the real world, the adversary is also not getting anything, all right? On top of that, since the situations are indistinguishable, here the two parties do end up getting keys which are the same, okay? So that would mean here also the two parties end up getting the keys which are the same, all right? But the, what I really want to emphasize here is that there is this environment who drives these games, and that is a key feature here, all right? Normally what you do is when you do security definitions in terms of ideal functionalities, you say that, okay, there is, there is for every adversary, there is some adversary or a simulator in the ideal world such that the situations are indistinguishable, okay? Indistinguishable to whom, all right? So you say, okay, they're indistinguishable to the adversary himself, okay? But in the UC security, you don't say that. You have another party, which is the environment, which actually drives the whole experiment. It actually feeds the inputs to the parties also, okay? In both situations, yeah. So like one, one difference might be an example that you gave. Uh, the environment can tell that the two parties got the same key. You know, when they were supposed to agree on a key, they got the same key. The adversary, Presumably couldn't tell that. So if you didn't, if you only had simulability with respect to the adversary, you wouldn't inherit properties of correctness. Yeah. Uh, well, and even if you take that approach, so one thing could be like let's define a slightly more generalized ideal functionality, which is called the password-based uh, key exchange. So there's some authentication built in. All right. So we want to build in some authentication. So the two parties, they want to do a key exchange, but they also want to authenticate to each other, okay? Only if they authenticate to each other would they. So you could say that they share a password to start with, all right? And, but then what you could do is you can make the environment give them the password, okay? And then the environment can give them a weak password. So even in a weak password setting, you're, you're claiming security then, all right? If, if, you, if you are not doing this in terms of the environment, then defining security for weak password becomes very tricky, all right? And here it's very easy to argue about that. And then the other part is, of course, that the environment could itself be parallel copies of this protocol, all right? So you could be running this protocol and there could be a parallel copy of this protocol running, so a different session, for instance, all right? that different session could just be put inside the environment, all right? Or you're using some random bits which you're trying to share with some other programs. They could all go into the environment. So that's why you get universal composability. Once you prove this simulatability in terms of this environment driving the whole experiment, then you get universal composability. It's not a very difficult proof, actually, to come to think about it, so, you know. So, but one thing, I don't know if people are familiar with zero knowledge, uh, 
because you must have heard in zero knowledge protocols there is this notion of rewinding okay uh, so so in zero knowledge protocols for instance what you say is that you know for 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 every adversary there is a simulator who can actually simulate that whole transaction without actually having the secrets all right so that would tell you that in 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 the real world no secret was leaked because you know the simulator could simulate it even without the secrets all right so that's a notion of zero knowledge but that kind of simulatability usually requires that this simulator can somehow rewind that adversary rewind means it can say okay go back to the previous state let me see what you did there all right and do that kind of thing all right but you can't do that here because any time this simulator tries to rewind this one that new information goes back to the environment and then the environment is able to distinguish the two situations so so that's a one very important thing to remember that you see proofs are much more trickier because the definition requirement is much more stringent and normal zero knowledge proofs may not lead to uc secure proofs all right uh, on the other hand <clears throat> this is very good for the theme i am going to talk about all right where you want to do automatic proof generation all right because now you have ruled out this rewinding kind of proofs all right and those can be very tricky and that that does require a lot of human ingenuity if if i may use that word all right so those are very tricky proofs and although i'm not saying that can't be automated of course you can automate anything if you think about it deep enough all right but and that's the whole thing you know i mean there is this notion that human beings are somehow different from computers we are not really I mean, whatever we do we can can also automate that so <laughs> it's just that you have to think deep enough to how to automate it all right that's now mandatory for someone from one yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> okay so so how does this proofs work so this is one way of proving these things so what you really do in these proofs of showing simulation is that this simulator oops sorry this simulator actually just takes that adversary all right and simulates this interaction for the ad adversary all right so here's the adversary in the real world he has some interaction going on if the simulator can just simulate this big fat arrow to that adversary in the real world using this somehow okay so this simulator has access to some information from the ideal functionality okay it could be a very minimal amount of information all right but it has some access and that's part of the specification of the ideal functionality all right so so the simulator's job is now to somehow recreate this in its own mind let's put it this way all right and use whatever information is getting from this ideal functionality and just recreate this big fat arrow all right of course there is also this thing that these arrows also have to be simulated but those are not the simulator's job okay that the ideal functionality itself is set up so that these and these values are indistinguishable as it is okay it can happen that the simulator is also allowed to feed some information into the ideal functionality okay that's also possibility and that could possibly drive back some of the results here all right so it's not that the simulator is totally doing stuff which does not affect this all right so it's possible the simulator feeds something in here which goes back to these dummy parties so there are a whole bunch of different scenarios so it's a very general paradigm but the key point is that the simulator tries to simulate these parties as its own code all right and using this ideal functionality so i'm slightly confused by the 
purple arrows. If that, so the environment sees everything that's going, I mean, what is it, what exactly is, is the environment observing? Obviously the environment is not observing the inner workings of X, for example, yeah. but, and comparing them to the inner workings of A. Mm -hmm. So, so adversary reports, for instance, the adversary is, can be reporting anything to this environment. And the environment could also be telling the adversary that you should do this, 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 all right? So that's fine. But what you are probably more confused about these purple arrows, which are going to the parties, all right? Those are just the inputs to the parties, okay? So the, I see, those are just the inputs? And maybe the outputs. Oh, okay, so I see, okay, yeah. cause, oh, yeah. so, so All right. it's just the I.O. behavior. Yeah, so the input could be, this guy says, okay, you guys, both of these, you guys take this password. In fact, he could be giving them wrong passwords. That's also part of the specification, All right? And then at the end of it, both of them have computed a key, they output it back to the environment. If you think about it, when you compute a key, you're going to use it for something, you know. So that's why you output to the environment, because you're going to use that key in some other bigger setting. That's the way to think about it. So that's why there is the input-output behavior, which is available to them. And the, and the workings in this ideal uh, world situation is that the dummy part is, whatever input they get, they just feed it here. They don't do any computation. And whatever output they get back from the ideal function, they just report back. So that's the workings in the ideal world. Okay, so this one just shows how the universal composability follows. And I kind of gave you a hint, basically, all right? But, uh, but this is stated here like a theorem. So let's say you have this real protocol now using another protocol pi. So there is this protocol rho, okay, which is using pi, and I think in the previous slide, uh, yes, I had called this pi, okay, this protocol was pi, okay. Now that pi protocol is used as an ideal functionality by a bigger protocol rho between some of the same parties, let's say. All right. So then the universal composability theorem says that once you have shown that pi and f are more or less identical, okay, or the way to say it is that pi realizes the ideal functionality f, then you can just throw in this protocol, if you can prove this to be secure for something, then you can just throw pi into that and then you get a completely real protocol, all right? So that's a very nice theorem to have. And that's very good for automatic proofing, uh, theorem proving, all right? Because you want to make your proofs compositional. And it's even more important because a lot of Crypto protocols use heavy duty algebra, for instance. You, know, you may be using you know, some elliptic curves or something else. All right? So what you really want to do is, you want to prove some properties about that, somehow axiomatize it, let's say. Okay? And then just have an ideal functionality, and you can even have that as an assumption, for instance. You don't even have to prove things. Half of cryptography works like that anyway. All right? So we have assumptions. All right? So you can, you can have assumptions as ideal functionalities, okay? So all the real heavy duty math, which would be very difficult to argue, like you, know, you may be running into number theory, general purpose, all right? So you just want to push all that into some axiomatization. And then, having done that, then your protocol will work in this hybrid model, all right? Which is using these axiomatizations for proving higher level protocols, all right? So a simple example is just, you know, the, the Diffie-Hellman assumption, all right? So, I mean, you don't want to deal with, you know, groups and exponentiations and things like that, all right? So all you can use like a 
DDH or a decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption, which will tell you that, you know, you're given two or three, a tuple of three things, it's indistinguishable from the, this another th three tuple of things, all right? And then, you know, you use that axiomatization, and then you build bigger protocols around that, okay? And what the key claim of our whole theme is that most of these bigger protocols are in a very simple language, all right? Uh, so, and for that simple language, you can actually automate things uh, very easily and in a very efficient manner, all right? So, and that, and given the fact that most crypto protocols, these bigger, higher level protocols are actually very simple, you know, like 10 line programs, a 15 line program. All right, a few variables here and there. You know, even if it was like exponential in that, you know, you're still pretty fast, okay? So that's the whole theme here. Um, so, so that's, you know, it's very tedious sometimes to do these UC proofs. There are so many scenarios and you write down all these proofs in, in, in full detail. They can run for pages and it's very easy to you know, miss one or two cases here and there, okay? So it will just be nice if it could just be automated, this whole process, all right? And we're not talking about verification, all right, of a given proof, okay? We're talking about actually generating the proof. But we're not talking about generating the protocol, which could be another step forward, okay? So well, that's also actually conceivable. If, if, if you think about it, for, you know, long enough with a lot of hard work, maybe we can <laughs> lead to that goal too, where you actually synthesize protocol. Given an ideal functionality, just come up with a protocol. So just to give an example, all right, so like this is a typical crypto protocol, all right? And this is from a paper by Ran Kennedy and Mark Fishlin, you know, and I don't expect you to actually understand what's going on here, but this is just an example that you know, things are in a very simple language, so to speak, all right? Uh, there is a pseudo-random generator here, but let's say you have axiomatized that, all right? And that is just one ideal functionality which you're gonna be using, okay? And then the higher level protocol here is is in a very simple language, and I'll describe what that language is. Okay, so these are the results we have, and, and we expect to extend these results quite a bit, okay? Uh, the only thing is that the proofs of these results get hairier and hairier, all right? You know, and it's really a lot of hard work to prove for even simple stuff, okay? So, but I think it's a, it's a worthy a goal to actually prove these things once and for all. Not just for the sake of even uh, just automatic theorem proving, but this also helps us to come up with manual proofs. All right. We actually get to know that, ah, these are the limitations of a particular kind of simulatable proof, and these are, this is achievable or not achievable, you know, just from a manual point of view, okay? So the simple language we'll have uh, will basically be like branching program. There'll be like if then else statements, okay? And we'll allow uh, random number generation, okay? Because most crypto protocols definitely need random numbers. And uh, we'll have conditional if statements. Uh, we'll only allow XOR, we won't allow arbitrary algebra. So we'll allow XOR, which is just addition in, in Galois fields of characteristic two, for instance, all right? So, so we'll allow uh, this additives group of uh, Galois fields of characteristic two. And, you know, and the conditionals will be built out of equality of such objects, okay? 
So that's where it becomes slightly nonlinear, okay? Because if you're just allowing XOR, everything is linear. So that's very easy to handle, all right? But if you allow conditional statements, then suddenly your expressions are nonlinear. And that's what we call pseudo-linear, because we don't allow arbitrarily nonlinear stuff, okay? But this, just these conditionals are equality of uh, these XOR ex op, uh, expressions. Now, we would obviously like to have some tables and some storage in these functionalities, okay? And that's very important. I mean, obviously, a lot of, most of the useful functionalities have some amount of storage, all right? For instance, you save your password, or you, in a, in a functionality, for instance, which does public key encryption, you know, you save what all was encrypted and what ciphertext you gave out. And then, but all the operations on these tables are very simple. You know, you just search for a ciphertext in your table, and if it's found, you return the plain text corresponding to it. Okay, there's no real algebra going on there. Okay. And also, the, the entries in these tables are of fixed size, depending on a security parameter, all right? If you allow arbitrary sized entries in your table, then it becomes undecidable, all right? Because you can, you can do halting problem and things like that, all right? But if your table entries are of a fixed size, then it's actually a decidable system, all right? Oh, no, both. Both. So yeah. The protocol is, yeah. Yeah. But the protocol is defined in terms of another ideal functionality? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. That also has this form. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very key point. So all the algebra, you want to hide in these ideal functionalities. Okay. And, uh, and either you assume or you're hand-proven that that algebra is simulatable by these ideal functionalities. Right. Of course, I mean, one goal could be to extend it to other groups, right? Obviously, you know. And it's not uh, out of range, okay? So you have to look at what fragments you can do, all right? So we start with one of these simple fragments, all right? Obviously, then the next goal would be, okay, let's do exponentiations and see how that works, all right? Uh, then you can talk about, you know, universal hash functions and things like that, and some nice experimentations of those, and those hash-proof systems in this kramer shoop kind of thing. Um, so in this slide, I have like uh, two things in red, okay, which is random number generation and, and persistent variables. And they are in red because they require really more difficult proofs. Not that the simple things require easy proofs. That's also pretty tricky to prove, all right? But once you introduce random number generation and persistent variables, the proofs are very tricky. Uh, because uh, le let me say upfront that one of our key ideas here is that while this is decidable, these are decidable systems. They may be exponential or even double or triple exponential in the program sizes, okay? Program size of the ideal functionality and of the real functionality. But it's independent of the security parameter. And that's the real key point, okay? So, but then there's a caveat to it that this only works for proofs which do not depend on security parameters. So most of the UC proofs that we actually do do not work uh, uh, based on the security parameter. They are just general purpose proofs, all right? But if you came up with some weird proof which actually required you to look at the security parameter, that wouldn't work here, all right? But we ignore those cases. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, to get into more specifics, all right. So let I mean the idea of these specifics is to see where are the difficulties in proving these things, all right. So so I have to give you some specifics here. So first, let's define what pseudo linear functions are. So I mean, as I said before, it, these are just if-then-else programs, all right, in the most basic form. You don't have to worry about persistent variables or storage or things like that. Just think about them as if-then-else programs, um, where the data objects are just uh, bit strings, all right? But you can you are allowed to do XORs while either outputting or while doing the conditionals. So. So these conditionals are usually called guards. Okay, so you, you can write a guarded expression. You you you, you can think of linear express, expressions like x1 plus x2, all right, or you can think of guarded linear expressions, where if x equals y, then output x1 plus x2, else if x equals y plus y3, then output something else. So there's a guard in front of each linear expression, all right? And that's the whole big expression, all right? So that's what is called a pseudo-linear expression. Uh, I mean, you can technically write these things as, as these polynomials by raising these uh, conditionals to the power q minus 1, okay? And which will be 1 or 0 depending on whether this was non-zero or, or zero in any finite field. But that's just a technicality. I mean, you don't have to think in those terms. But if you thought that somehow you could reduce this thing to some known results, then this is a good way to look at it. Because then you see that, ah, you do run into a lot of difficulties. If you just try to think of it in terms of what's already known, all right? Okay, so here is one theorem which we are interested in. Okay, so you are given uh, some whole bunch of k functions which are all pseudo linear in these k atomic variables x x one to x k. Okay, and you are also given another target function, okay, which is also pseudo linear in these atomic variables. So that uh, kind of answers your question you had earlier, okay? So the target function is also pseudo-linear, and the input functions are all pseudo-linear, okay? So then the claim is that if this target function is at all a function of these input functions, then it must be a pseudo-linear function of those functions, all right? Uh, no, not necessarily. Well, but I think the point is that you want the description n to be a variable rather and have the same, have a uniform description in n, not a description that doesn't depend on n. So probably if, if you're, you know, for every fixed n, any function over fn is pseudo-linear. But if you look at one, one family of functions, Yeah, I mean, one, one way to look at it is, is in these terms, all right? A function, you could write a function, so a pseudo-linear function will always have this form, okay? There will be one linear term, and then these guards are just powers of Q minus one. But if, they, if, you, if you had Q fixed, yeah. you could say, if X1 is zero, I'll put this. Oh, okay. If X1 equals one, right. I'll put this. If X1 yeah. equals but that means that the description would be growing with n. Right. And so it would be a non-uniform description. Oh, yeah, that's true. So you're looking at uniformly pseudo-linear functions. You mean they're expressed by a fixed polynomial? Right. A fixed polynomial, right. and then you look at n as, as growing. Yeah. Because then you can never refer to x, n. 
So if you were doing that, then your proofs would be dependent on security parameter because then your program itself will start growing with the security parameter. All right. Here, these are uniform descriptions. Right? He's right to point that out. Yeah, oh, okay. right. Yeah, that's the security parameter. Oh, okay. That's hidden yeah. inside X1. So uniformly described yeah. by uh, right. these Xi's are vectors. They're right. not bits. Yeah, they're not bits. They're, they're, bits. Okay. they're in a field Q. Okay, It's just in characteristic 2. Okay, so that's the whole idea. And by the way, if, if you didn't have the pseudo linear but just linear, then it's you know obvious. Everybody knows that. All right. if, if something is a function, function, if something is a linear function and it's a function of other linear function, then it must be a linear function of those things. Okay. But if you restrict the pseudo linear. So some examples of things like you say like password authenticated key generation. So there the function would be described like you'd have the input from player one, the input from player two, and the randomly generated key. Right. And it would be something like if the input for player one matches the password, then give them the key. Yeah. Right. And, and, and that's it. There is no bit length or anything mentioned there. Yeah. yeah. So it's just a simple if then else program. Yeah. Ah, examples, all right? So, so here is uh, one function, which is x1, and just to remind you again, that x1, x2 are in arbitrarily long, large fields, all right? Not just gf2, okay? Uh, so there is one function f1, and there's this other function f2, which is basically this, forget that description. It says that f2 is 0 if either of x1 or x2 is 0. Otherwise, it's x1 plus x2. Okay, So that's pseudo linear function. And then you have a target function x1. And now the question is, can x1, and note that x1 is also a pseudo linear function. All right? These two are pseudo linear function, and that's also pseudo linear function. So the question is, can x1 be a function of these two? Okay. Uh, so the proof will work by doing these truth tables of sorts. Okay. But rather than going like by you know all values, there is a slightly more restricted truth table here. All right. So what you do is you list all linear combinations of the atomic variables like x1, x2, and x1 plus x2. All right, and then you distinguish the rows based on whether that value is zero or non-zero. Okay, that's all. Okay, so that's the key distinction. Okay, so in this one, all three are zero. In this one, this is non-zero, and we just call it x one because it's some quantity non-zero. This is supposed to be zero, and then obviously this will be just x one because x two is zero. All right. So as you can see, this column can actually just be derived from these things, except in the last case, okay, where it is saying that x1 is non-zero, x2 is non-zero, and x1 and x2 are actually not the same. So that's the reason why this is non-zero. Okay? Because if these two were same, you would have had this situation, okay? x1, x1, 0. Okay? So these are all the cases, basically. And then you write your function for, for each of these cases, okay, f1, f2, and this f2. Now notice this row, sorry, this row. You notice that the function in this row is not even a linear combination of f1 and f2, just restricted to that row. Okay? And that tells you that this cannot be a function of f1. Uh, the last row is X1 plus X2. right, so it's not a linear combination, right? So that's also a counterexample, right? So 
Okay, so that was one example. Let's take another example. So here we, we change these functions where that problem went away and your problem also went away, all right? So, but there's another problem here, okay? And this is a very key feature here. Look at these two rows, okay? In these two rows, you'll notice that while this is equal to this guy, this is not equal to this guy. Okay. But why are we worried about these two rows? We, we focus on any two rows such that their signature is the same. Zero, non-zero signature is same, all right? So here, this is zero and this is non-zero and this is zero and this is non-zero. Don't have to be the same value, just zero and non-zero. So such rows are to be seen as isomorphic, all right? And then in that case, for these isomorphic rows, this function has to be the same linear combination of those values. So is this because the only test you have is a zero test? Is, yeah. Is that, that's basically it's just coming that you're, right. you have one conditional, which is a zero. Right. So, so that's an important point here. So this also gives a counterexample that this thing is not a function of this thing. All right. Okay, so now in this third example, we fixed everything, all right? So this one is a linear combination of these two, and this is a linear combination of these two, but the coefficients are the same. It's the same linear combination. And if you checked it over all such rows, if all these conditions were valid, then this is actually a function of these two. And in that case, it actually turns out to be a pseudo-linear function. All right. So, so that's why we want to focus on what's actually a basis for pseudo-linear functions. All right. Because without a basis, we can't get much of a proof. All right. So it's all it's interesting just to figure out what is the basis for pseudo-linear functions. Okay. Uh, so, so first we define this notion called elementary pseudo-linear polynomials, okay? So what these are is basically you look at all subspaces of linear expressions, okay? So for each, each subspace would form like a guard, okay? So, so these are the elementary pseudo-linear polynomials where the guards are like our subspaces. I see. So the one plus is just that this is the characteristic two. Right. So, so basically it is saying that whenever Lx is non-zero, okay, uh, this quantity will become one, so it will be zero, all right? So Lx better be zero for this to have any non-zero value, all right? So, and all other things Lx which are not in J, J they should be non-zero, all right? So these are the elementary pseudo-linear polynomials. But do they form a basis, okay? Now there could be some dependent such polynomials. So you want to rule out all the dependencies, all right? And the one way to do it is that the dependency will come in these, what's allowed in this px, okay? px are supposed to be linear polynomials. These were the guards and that's the linear polynomial. So if you allow arbitrary px, then there could be dependencies, all right? Because for certain guards, two px could be the same thing. As we saw in one of those examples, where if x1 is non-zero and x2 is, is equal to x1, then x1 plus x2 is just zero, all right? So if you rule out all those dependencies, and I won't go into all the details, just, then you'll get all what's called basic pseudo-linear polynomials. Uh, I'm thinking whether I should go through this proof. Uh,
Hmm? I should? Okay. Um, there so, is, uh, I'm more interested in what you're going to use it for. Right. So let's see. So you, you understood that there is a basis of these pseudo-linear polynomials, all right? So now uh, what we need, I, I should at least describe this notation of J. So this notation is useful here, right? So let let Q X be just the set of all basic pseudo-linear polynomials, all right? And then G X be all the guards. And as I said, in these basic pseudo-linear polynomials, the guards are given by linear subspaces. Okay. So uh, for each such linear subspace. Okay, I guess this is tricky because I can't really describe it without going back. So, I see. You say what you're trying to do here. So you kind of like give a procedure to tell whether two pseudo-linear programs are identical. Two, two pseudo-linear functions. Well, I already described to you the procedure. All right. So the basic idea was that you you list down all pseudo-linear basis polynomials. All right. And for when you have a whole bunch of functions and you, you have a target function, you want to check if the target function, which is itself a pseudo-linear function, yeah. is a function of these input functions. Then you look at all the isomorphic rows as far as the guards are concerned. Yeah. All right? So look, you look for the signature of 0 and non-zero. And for all rows which have the same signature, you want to make sure that the target function is the same linear combination. And once you have that condition, then f is a pseudo-linear function, and f is like, otherwise f is not even a function of these things. So what I, I guess what I'm confused is you said that, um, that your goal is to, given a protocol defining, supposedly computing f from f1 through f space, um, to verify that that, you know, prove that that protocol is all right. But this seems to be deciding the question, given f and f1 through f space, does there exist a protocol? So it seems to be the protocol finding problem rather than the protocol verifying problem. Oh, uh, no, no. That's not true. Because so what you have, you, you have a target function, which is the protocol itself. OK. OK. So the target function, you. You, what you do is, given a protocol, you first serialize it. Okay, so that would, and let's, because most of there. First of all, it, let it be clear that there are no loops involved here. All right, so everything is a branching program. So, given a target function, there may be interaction between different parties. You just serialize one such interaction. All right, so that gives you one long if-then-else program. All right, so that's the target function. Okay. And that target function is something, let's say, which the environment gets to see, okay, based on its own input. Okay. So, or this is what an adversary may be seeing in the yeah. real world. So, in the ideal world, now you want to recreate this function. That would be the simulator to recreate this function. All right. So, how do you recreate that function? What you're given is these small ideal functionalities, okay, or whatever little you get from the ideal functionalities, all right. So can you compute this function, which would be a simulation, using these ideal functionalities? So that's what the job is. Right? Uh, okay, I already showed this. So that's the notion of interpolatable, okay, which is basically this function, any pseudo-linear function is interpolatable in terms of a bunch of functions if each row is a linear combination, okay, and then for each iso each two isomorphic rows 
it's the same linear combination. So that's the notion of interpolatable. And that's what the theorem says, that if, if the function, the target function is pseudolinear, and if it is interpolatable in terms of the original given function, then f is a pseudolinear function. So what's, what is surprising about this is, so, so this part, part is kind of easy to think of. Right? The surprising lemma is the following, that if f is a pseudolinear function, and if it is not interpolatable, then f is not even a function of f. Okay? Let alone, I mean, it's forget about whether it's a pseudolinear function, it's not even a function. Okay? And that is a bit surprising. Uh, So the way it works is that basically, you know, you have to generate uh, two points in your field, okay, where the target functions are identical, okay. Sorry, the, the input functions, all k of them, have the same values, but the target function has different values, all right. So what this requires is that your field be large, okay. It should be at least be as large as uh, two to the power the number of variables. Okay, but uh, but that's okay because your proofs, which you are working for, are independent of your security parameter anyway. So if they were working, they would have worked for the larger fields too. Okay, so to make the thing slightly more complicated. What we really need to look at is iterated composition pseudolinear functions. Okay, so till now we just looked at just monolithic programs. Okay, but if you're thinking uh, of real uh, applications of you know a real protocol and an ideal protocol, the simulator has to call these ideal functionalities with some of its own arguments. Okay, so that that is normally the way the simulator does its job. All right, it generates some random values of its own or some something it's simulating. Okay, and then it calls the ideal functionality with those arguments. So then these theorems become really tricky now. All right. So so of course we can prove a completeness theorem for this. Too, all right. It's just more tricky, and now the field size has to grow even slightly larger. All right. Uh, so the field size is now two to the two n instead of two to the n, and that is because first of all we can't even do a deterministic simulation. Okay. So here is an example. Okay. So what happens when you're iterating things? So consider an ideal functionality, and where this ideal functionality allows an argument which a simulator can call with. And let's call that argument y. Okay. So the so the input function is basically return x, where x is, for instance, let's say the password which the environment had provided it. Okay, so if the simulator calls with the password, then it will return x itself, which is the password. So basically saying, ah, you found the password. Otherwise, it will just return zero. Okay. And the real function is just computing the password. Now the question is, can this be computed as a iterated function of this functionality? But it can by doing a brute force search, all right? So what you do is you call this, and not in pseudo-linear terms, I'm talking about arbitrary function, okay? There is an arbitrary iterated function which will compute this thing given this thing because you run through each and every possible value in the field. And at some point you'll hit the correct value and it'll tell you, ah, this is the correct value, all right? So here is a case where this is a function of this iterated function, but it's definitely not a pseudolinear function. And why is not a pseudolinear function? 
because in pseudo linear function you can't run over all possibilities you know you'll have to generate each element that will be a nonlinear thing right <coughs> but of course this doesn't serve as a counter example for our main theme because this actual simulation was uh, exponential right because you had to do a brute force search okay so it's not really a counter example so it didn't bother us much okay but you could think that ah maybe there is some example which is you know not doable right uh, but that's not the case and that's what we prove right so to give you another example here is another just the reverse situation okay so the ideal function will return 0 let's say if you hit the password okay otherwise it will actually give you the password all right so it just does the opposite thing okay and the real function is also just the password okay so obviously this is simulatable because you know if you if you try two or three times, you will hit something which is neither zero or password, and which will then return x. All right. So that computes that function. But this one is still not deterministically pseudolinear simulatable <coughs> because any. First of all, okay. So to be more specific in this pseudo linear definition we didn't allow any constants at all okay it there was nothing affine about it it's just purely linear all right but even if you threw in a few constants which is what you would like to do you definitely want to throw in a few constants otherwise you'll have really trivial programs okay so you could say okay we can throw in a few constant number of constants all right but then you could have a ideal functionality where these constants are all kind of put in there. So you, you could have the case that this is not deterministically simulatable. But what you can show is it is probabilistically simulatable. All right? So the simulator can generate a random number and then with that you will get that thing. So then the question arises if it's going to do these randomized programs are the decision procedures going to depend on the security parameter suddenly okay Be okay but that's not the case because the random number generation is also like a length independent part of the program right you just say you know gen generate one number random So, so this is kind of just showing that there is this trickiness going on here. So when you're dealing with these iteratable functions, we have to come up with the notion of super guards. Okay. The guards were just these conditionals. And remember, we generated this table, truth tables of zero and non-zero values, where all the guards were listed. But if you're gonna allow arguments okay let's say there was a single argument small y so these were the original atomic variables capital x and there was a single argument variable y okay now suddenly the guards are in x union y okay and whereas the actual function did not have y in it okay the actual target function was just in terms of x y was just another argument which was allowed for the simulator to call in okay so you're looking at target functions which are just in x but the input functions have x and y as variables all right so the target functions truth table would just be guards in x all right but in the input functions the truth tables are in this super guards so that whole idea of the last couple of slides where I had those tricky examples was that there are these degenerate super guards, okay, 
which are difficult to get to with in a deterministic pseudolinear fashion. But if you allow a probabilistic program, then you can get to those degenerate superguides. Anyway, these are very complicated issues and it is very hard to describe these things in a very limited amount of time. But I just wanted to give you a gist of the complications here. And as you can see, this is we have not even like scratched the surface here. All right, we just talked about monolithic if then else programs and then, then I showed you something about iterations. But I didn't talk about randomized programs themselves, all right? Because there was no scope in these statements of any randomized programs, all right? And then I didn't talk about persistent variables where there was small amount of storage between different calls to this thing. And it, the proofs get more and more difficult, all right? <coughs> but I just wanted to give you a flavor. And, uh, and I think it's a very useful exercise, even whether or not you're interested in automating on, you know, it's just useful to know whether a certain kind of programs can be obtained from other programs. Okay, thank you. <coughs>